Good morning, and welcome to our service at the Olive Branch Community Church. I'm Ann Eisen, and I pastor our Super Kids ministry while caring for others in our community. And that's what we want to do, care and connect with everyone at the Olive Branch. And there's two ways that you can do that. If you would like to get our e-blasts and find out what's happening at our church and stay on top of what's going on with the Olive Branch, please send us your contact information. All you have to do is go to our main page on our website, tob.ca, and find where it says sign up today and give us your current contact information and you'll receive our e-blasts. The second way to connect is through life groups. Our life groups are going on and it's not too late to sign up. So check that out also on our main page, life groups, and you can sign up right there on the website. So remember that connecting is so important. Relationships are super important to God and they're important to us too at the Olive Branch. Let's worship together now with Pastor Dan and team and then continue on with Pastor Ken in the series called The Gods Must Be Crazy. Who I am. 
Thank you, Dan, for leading us in worship this morning. Again, it's always good to know who's in charge of everything whenever you start any given day, whenever you start any service, at the beginning of anything that you ever do. So reminder that God is in charge of all things is always good. Just, uh, we're in this series of talks, and, uh, and the series is called The Gods Must Be Crazy. And what it's talking about, what we're dealing with, is the little g gods that sometimes creep up in our lives. Uh, they're actually idols. That's what the Old Testament calls them. They're idols. They're the, they're the places where we go to where sometimes we say we serve God and love God, but we actually go to these places to get our answers. And if there's ever a time in history when the little g gods have failed us, it would be at this time in history when uh, the COVID-19 virus has taken so much down and so on. We begin to understand that we are not in control of our lives, at least not to the extent that we thought that we were. So that's kind of where we are. And as we start, I just want to encourage you to stay connected with us in a number of different ways. And we have life groups that are starting up. We would like to be connected with you through the emails that we sent out. But we need your permission to do this. Um, the church is called the body of Christ, and a body by definition is connected. And uh, so we will try to stay connected with you, and uh, you try to stay connected with us and others as we move forward. And at some point, we'll be able to come back together again as the church. One of my most powerful and painful memories uh, when I was in university was this ache that sometimes would appear right about here, right in the middle of my chest. And I, let me tell you when I would feel it. I would feel it when I would come to the campus center, and I'd see a couple snuggled up together, studying together or whatever on the couch, and I'd feel this ache down inside. I felt this ache when I was working the evening shift, you know, out at this building I used to work at that was about 30 miles from town, and, uh, and I would realize that something special was going on, Carol and Candlelight Service, and my friends would be there with their dates, and I would feel this ache down inside. It's called loneliness. I'm guessing that most of you have probably felt that as well. There was another powerful feeling that I also remember in university, and I'll bet you could relate to it as well. It's called sexual desire, okay? So I'm not going to get into that one at all, you know, no more information, not a zip, you know, none. But we all feel it, right? And these are the two most powerful desires that we feel down inside. I mean, there are lots of other ones, and so on. If we're hungry or thirsty, sometimes that cancels those out. But loneliness, the aloneness, the desire to love and be loved, and sexual desire are two very powerful, powerful desires that we have down inside. If you combine those together, what you would call them is you call them love, L-U-V, okay? So, you know, we understand that the little gods take and turn us into takers. Love, little God, little G God of, God, of, of uh, love, turns us into takers. God is the one who gives, and he turns us into givers, okay? That's the way it works. You can tell that there's a little G God going on in your life, and this is especially true when it comes to love, where it becomes the thing that you give ultimate worth to. In other words, it's what you pursue more than anything else. It's where you make your sacrifices. It's what you will sometimes flip God off to get. It's what you will break your promises for, and especially it's what you will violate your conscience for. And as you move on, Let's just talk about the difference between love versus love. Love is about chemicals, and I'm going to explain that in a little bit. Uh, love is about choice that you make. Love is about, I want it now. Love is patient. With love, sometimes we just, you know, there's no center line down the highway. We just do what we feel like doing. Love is about character. Love is about take. I want, I take. Love is I give. 
Love ultimately leads to regret. Love leads to being fulfilled. Love, love is about me, and love is about you. So kind of important to remember those things. And love is what we see in probably most of the movies and most of the music, that, and it gets, perceived, it gets pursued pretty much every minute of every day. Instagram, hookup website, websites, you know, Craigslist, Facebook, TikTok, in too many places. You know, some of it's kind of cute. Some of it is like really wrong. Like you don't want to even go there. And the really, really sad thing is that love, L-U-V, you know, promises to end the pain of aloneness, promises to end our sexual desire. But like anything that you, you know, indulge in or get addicted to, you feed an addiction and it always asks for more. Now, chemistry, love drugs, we're going to be talking about that. But I'll tell you, when you're driving or living under the influence, imagine traveling with somebody who's driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs or something else, pretty dangerous. To live your life under the influence of love drugs, it can be dangerous as well. And I just need to say that, you know, like any of the gifts that we, that we have when we turn into God's, they start out as good gifts. I mean, sexual desire, that's a good gift from God. The desire to not be alone, to love and be loved, that's a gift from God. But I'm telling you, it can drive your life and it can create a lot of damage. And here's what I think about, okay? Some of you might be thinking, okay, Ken, come on, stop messing around in our lives. This is just getting way too messy and uncomfortable, and just stay out of this stuff, and so on. And I'm talking about this because I'll tell you, I've worked with people for a long time, and this can be the single most destructive thing that happens in people's lives. For some people, you know, this love thing is kind of like Groundhog Day, you know? They keep living the same day over and over again. The faces change, the body change, but the results are still the same, and it leads to pain. So let's talk about what love really is, okay? We've talked about that a little bit. There's a myth that kind of drives this whole thing, and the myth is called the right person myth, okay? And this is kind of what it's like, if you wanted to actually put it there. So I've got this puzzle piece that's me, and out there is maybe, you know, Mr. Right. So I keep trying all the puzzle pieces with me to see which one. So there's Mr. Wrong, and there's Miss Maybe, and there's Mr. Definitely Wrong. And so you just keep on going, trying to find the right piece that goes on. And it's kind of at the core of every Disney movie, most Hallmark movies, you know, that you go out and you search the right for the right person. And when you find the right person, you fall in love and you get married and you live happily ever after. And so, you know, the, the word that kind of associates with you at this particular point is I've got to find the right person. I've got to attract the right person. Now, here's the way that love usually works in our culture, okay? When a person who is looking for Mr. or Miss Right, you know, uh, goes out shopping, they will likely at some point find an attractive someone else who is also looking for the right person. And what happens is, boom, man, there's chemistry there, you know? And there's even a soundtrack and a song, you know? And, you know, at last, you know, and, and all these different things. There she was just walking down the street singing, do what, diddy, diddy, dum, diddy, do, you know? Uh, you are my special angel. I mean, there's all these, and they're all old songs. I'm sure there's some more current ones. So how do you know it's the right person? Anybody know? Well, it's love drugs. It's chemistry. It's like, oh, you know, we just look into one another's eyes, you know, and we dream about each other, and we can't stop talking, you know, and I can't keep my mind off of him, and he can't keep his hands, can't keep his, you know, other things off of me. Chemistry is amazing stuff, and we were made for chemistry. That's true. But what happens is sometimes two people get together and they're in love and they're in love and, and you know, and, and, and of course the movies tell us what comes next, right? The intimacy of their, of their relationship increases. And kind of the sales pitch for this is, well, you never buy a car without, you know, test driving it, you know, making sure you never buy shoes without trying them on first. And that's kind of the, the thing that goes on, except this is a person with a soul, not shoes, not a car. Now, when you're on love drugs, you know, Here's the key feeling. 
When you try to talk to somebody who's on, who's on love drugs, you know, it's kind of like no one has ever felt like this before. Like, this is true because I feel it deep down, you know, and, and all of this stuff is based on, on chemistry. Now, when you ask them about, well, what about your relationship? Like, what kind of person is this? Well, you know, it doesn't matter because they're the right person. The right person will know what to do. And when you ask somebody who's kind of deep in a chemistry experience and talk to them about how the Bible defines love, you know, that love is patient and love is kind and love is not rude, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not easily angered. And this person is going like, well, check, 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 you know, like look up love, you know, and and our picture is there because we're in love. Well, then they get married and what happens is at some point they have problems. They don't have chemistry problems. Chemistry is there but they have relational problems, okay? Getting along. And guess what begins to suffer when somebody starts to have relationship problems? The chemistry suffers. And all of a sudden, that which once seemed so filled with passion begins to, begins to cool off and begins to die, and they both notice it, okay? And the guy thinks, well, you know, if we just had more sex, that would fix it, you know? And the girls would say, that's not how you fix things, you know? And what's confusing for both is that the chemistry part that made the other person the right person, it isn't working. You know why? It's because great relationships are not based on chemistry. That's part of it. But great relationships have to be built. The saga continues. Sometimes one person in the relationship, usually the woman kind of has an idea and says, well, I know what will make us closer. Let's have a baby, you know, be kind of a combination of both of us, you know. And guy thinks, well, that'll require sex. That's brilliant, you know. That's a great idea. And so all of a sudden they have this baby and they bring another person, demanding little person, into this marriage or this relationship that's already troubled. You know, and, and sometimes a woman begins to think, well, this is crazy. I'm doing all the work, you know. And the guy begins to think, hey, I used to be first. Now I'm like third or fourth or tenth place. And the chemistry is flickering. So one day... You know, the guy in the relationship or the girl in the relationship is at work and they're experiencing all this pressure at home and guess who they meet? They meet the right person. And think to themselves, you know, well, I know what's wrong with my marriage. I married the wrong person and now I've met the right person and Groundhog Day starts and, you know, round two, you know, same drama, same line, same story thing, and except the faces change and the bodies change. And they keep, we keep doing the same things over and over again and expecting that things are going to be different. And that's how love goes. Love goes just about every single day in our world. Now, here's what I want to say. It doesn't have to be that way. If you're single or single again or whatever, you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to go down that trail. Relationships can really be satisfying. They can really be fulfilling. They're a lot of work, but I'm telling you, it can fill up your heart. But here's what you need to know. Write it down. Love, you know, chemistry is the cheap imitation of what God wants to do in the human heart. And if you fall for the imitation, I'll tell you what happens. You get cheated many times out of the real thing because chemistry cannot provide the stability that two people need to build a good relationship. Now, love and attraction and chemistry, I mean, it's a gift. It's a great gift from God. It happens. It offers, you know, but what happens is that you, when you offer sacrifices of yourself, and of your character and your time to the little G God of love, you end up with more, play, more pain than pleasure along the line. There's actually a technical term for the love drugs that we, are, we find ourselves on. A, a, a psychologist by the name of Dorothy Tenoff coined the term. It's limerence, okay? So this is kind of how it looks like. This is like 50 years ago. And there really is, you know, 
that really is love drugs, like you really do get on these things. Dopamine is what happens when you fall in love with somebody, and there are some characteristics, you know, you can't concentrate on anything else. You know, you've heard that before. Oh, yeah, I can't think about him all the time, or, you know, or you put this person on a pedestal, like you're blind to their faults, okay, which is good at first, not good later on. You're agonizing about whether or not they feel the same about you, like it's, this fills your mind all the time. Your heart pounds, you lose your appetite. This means you're on dopamine, you know? It's love. I want you. Now, this is the body's natural pleasure drug, okay? And when you're on it, you feel better than you've ever felt in your life. You feel pretty, you know, you, you feel handsome, you feel strong, you, you know, you, you, you see yourself as different than you, than you were. But there's another problem with dopamine and that is that when you're on dopamine, when you're on the pleasure drug, there's another drug that goes through your body too, and it's called serotonin. And this is kind of the wisdom drug. This is what helps you to make good decisions. Dopamine tends to crowd out the serotonin. There's lower levels of serotonin. In other words, you know, I, I'm thinking straight, then uh, there is dopamine. And that creates problems. So you like my drawing here, you know, I got the dopamine, you know, and I got the little hat, you know, with the, with the tassel on it, you know. This is, I want you, this is, love is, I know you, I want to know you. You know how long the dopamine lasts? Anywhere between 18 and 36 months. Now, maybe that's structured that way, I don't know. But what happens is, you know, you, you know you've heard the phrase, the honeymoon is over. Well, that's when the dopamine runs up. And... The hope is, and I think the way God designed it, is that by that point, you would be able to really know the person and you would have a more stable relationship because you're thinking a little bit straighter, okay? Now, when, when the dopamine is running the show, at that point, like, you're, you know, you're driving under the influence, and the biggest tragedy is that there are some really bad things that happen sometimes because of this, okay? Now, I want to uh, tell you a story, and you're familiar with the story because I've told it before, but it's about David. So David is this wise, godly leader. Like, he's able to bring two nations together or two different tribes together, lead them. People love him. People respect him. He's, like, immense, okay? But... What happens is there comes a point in his life, he's probably in middle age, and he's supposed to be off on the battlefield. He's, it says at the time when kings go off to war, he stayed home. So all these guys are out there. He's home. He you know, wakes up. He's restless, gets up you know, late afternoon after his nap and so on. He's out walking on the roof of his castle, and he happens to look down next door to his next door neighbor, and Bathsheba is down there naked taking a bath on the roof. Okay? Now, Here's the deal, okay? One of his good friends uh, was Uriah, the Hittite. That was her husband. So David knows that Uriah is going to be off on the battlefield someplace. So I don't know what kind of connection it is. I just don't think that this was kind of a chance thing. So David looks down at her, sees her, wants her, which is love. He sends somebody over to get her. She comes over, and they have this little thing going on, glass of wine, you know, they end up in bed together, and so on. And then she sends him a note saying, oh, uh, I'm pregnant. Now, at that moment, David's, you know, got a scramble because you see his credibility is online. He's a godly man, man after God's own heart, leading the nation, and so on. And he gets the woman next door pregnant. That's a big problem. So he decides that he's going to kind of sneak around in the shadows and get this worked out. So he brings Uriah home, you know, and everything, gets him drunk, and tells him to go and be with his wife, and Uriah doesn't, and so on. Eventually, what David does is he sends him out to the battlefield, out to the front of the line, and Uriah gets killed, and then he marries Bathsheba, and of course, he's the hero. Here she is. She's a pregnant young woman, you know, living next door, you know, and she has her husband's baby, and so David marries her, and he adopts the baby, and it all looks really, really cool, except that God knew what was going on. And God told Nathan, the prophet, what was going on, and Nathan comes and puts his finger right in David's face. He says, you're the man. Now, to David's credit, he repents. He says, yeah, he says, oh, man, I went all, way off track. Oh, God, please forgive me. And you read his prayer for forgiveness in Psalm 51. The problem is, he has these boys 
these sons of his who are watching this whole thing go down, okay? See, that's the deal, parents. Your kids follow in the steps that you thought you covered up, but you didn't cover them up. So what goes on next is Amnon. So this is, you know, this is, what, this is the credibility gap. David is saying, what I say is be pure, be honest, be a man after God's heart, own heart like me. But what I do falls short of that. And there's this credibility gap there, hypocrisy. What David says with his actions that day is, if you want it, take it. Well, that's what Amnon does. Amnon, the prince, falls in love with a princess. The problem is, it's his half-sister, Tamar, okay? So he gets her in a place where she's in his room, and then he rapes her. He takes, if you want it, take it. And that's what he does. And I'm telling you, it destroys her life. You know, after this happens, he throws her out of the room, you know? He says he hated her as much as he loved her. Well, he didn't love her. He was in love with her, lust with her, okay? Well, Tamar has a brother by the name of Absalom. And Absalom watches this whole thing go down. He watches as his sister's, his sister's life, whom he loved, is destroyed. Two years later, and this is scene three, he invites all of his siblings, invites the whole family out to a picnic, okay? Family picnic. Right there in the middle of the family picnic, before they even get to the potato salad, Absalom, you know, kills Amnon right in front of everybody. Well, that creates a whole problem and, you know, it alienates him from David and there's all this stuff, you know, that goes on and so on in, in the family as you can possibly imagine. So, Absalom, you see, because of the rift that it's created between him and David and so on, because of all the other things going on, scene four, Absalom decides he's going to take his father out and take over the, take over the, you know, the kingdom. You see, if you want it, take it. And so he does. And co- this is like, you know, this like takes up six or seven chapters of David's story. And what you see in the final part of that story is you see Absalom hanging by his hair out of this tree, got caught up in the thing, and then has a spear through his heart. And David is crying. And David is saying, oh, Absalom, my son, my son, if only I had died instead of you. In other words, if only God had stricken me dead when I defied him instead of leaving this trail of chaos, instead of you dying. Scene five, Solomon, son of David and Bathsheba, you know, he figures, okay, I'm not going to engage in the lust problem. I'm just going to have so many wives, I will never have a lust problem. He marries a thousand women. He's like, you know, he's like trading them like baseball cards. And so he's immersed in love drugs, but the problem is he doesn't understand the pull that his wives have on him, and they're from other nations and so on, and he's got them to kind of seal treaty deals and so on. And so they basically draw his heart away from God, and at the end, as we talked about this uh, last week, it says that God was angry with Solomon because he was worshiping these other gods. When you're on love drugs, you don't think straight. When you're on love drugs, you know, you think to yourself, well, I can just dabble in this a little bit and I'll be fine. But it messes with how you're thinking. Now, you may be thinking, okay, come on, Ken, really. I mean, I'm not going to be looking through my neighbor's window at his wife or or at her husband, you know, and I'm not going to rape my half-sister. And, you know, I don't have a plan for revenge to take over the kingdom. And, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I don't have any plans for having, you know, a thousand husbands or a thousand wives. I mean, but I'll tell you what we do have in common. It's limerence. It's this drug, being on love drugs, being on dopamine, at the point where it affects our thinking. Last week, I talked about four of my heroes in ministry and how they've gone down. And I'll tell you, I've thought about them, and I've grieved over them, and I've asked, why? I've heard them all speak and been inspired. I've read their books, you know, and I've heard them speak forcefully against the very kinds of stuff that they did, just like David. And here's what I know. Love and the stuff that it brings into your life is deceptive, and it's addictive, and ultimately If you don't understand it, it will take you down a path, and it can wreck your life. Write this down someplace. 
playing the game of love in our world is progressive in nature. You feed an addiction and it grows. You see, most people don't, you know, first time go and take a swan dive into the cesspool. But they mess around the edges of truth and character for a while, and eventually they get drawn into it, and they think to themselves, how did I ever get here? And it's we get deceived a little bit at a time. Jesus, in talking about lust, which is a close relative of love, says the only way to stop this is radical surgery. He says, you think about it, you know, would you rather be inconvenienced for a while or, you know, or would you rather, you know, end up with a hell of a life? Like you got to decide because this stuff is, is invasive in our lives. And I'll tell you where it all starts. It's thinking to yourself, gee, you know, what the authors of the Bible had to say about love and sex and marriage is so antiquated. I mean, really, like wait until marriage comes. You got to be kidding me. This is so far removed from the world of 2021. Why would I even think of following that advice? Well, let's just say what you're really thinking, okay? God, you don't live here, okay? You, you were kind of off adjusting the twinkle on stars and stuff, and you don't know how hard this is. So I'm just going to kind of put this and put you in the background now. And like, we'll catch up maybe in a few years when I'm done having my fun, you know. And then you have to forgive me because you promised that you would always forgive me. So I'll come back and everything will be cool and we'll be good. You think about what makes something an idol, a little G God in our lives. Well, it replaces God. It's the, it's the place in our lives. It's what we give our ultimate worth to instead of just understanding that it's a gift. It's where we make our sacrifices, you know? And it gives, you know, where we make our, what we give our, our, make our sacrifices to gives clarity to what we're serving, whether we're serving God or whether we're serving some little G God. We all make sacrifices. And some of us sacrifice things that we wish that we had never sacrificed. I had a really close friend pastor, leader of other pastors, dad, grandfather. He was privately serving this little G God of love, but he was doing it on credit. And uh, this is kind of the way it works, okay? <clears throat> when we're on love drugs and we're dating, we're thinking, is this a good decision? Sex kind of blurs all the edges there between is this a good decision or not? And so you just have to understand that that's the way it's going to go. So anyways, this guy, this friend of mine, I mean, great guy, but he's spending in the present, but he's doing it on credit. And that's what happens. You spend, you spend, you spend, you spend in the present, which eventually comes, becomes your past, and then the bill comes in. Somebody finds out what's going on. Usually a husband or a wife or a child or, or somebody else. And then what happens is your present which becomes your past, comes up and it invades your future. And I'll tell you, if you've been spending heavily, you know, in the present, you know, when it comes to this love, God, I'm telling you, the bill comes due. It just always does. That's just the way, that's just the way it happens. Another sign of a little G God is what you're willing to flip God off for and choose the companionship of another little G God for, like love. Another sign is, you know, that you and I are serving a little G God is where we're willing to compromise our conscience. See, there's not a person I know of who would think to themselves, hey, this is fine. Like, you know, like this is, you know, you talk about this kind of stuff, serving the love God. You know, when people come to talk to me as a pastor, they rarely, you know, come in and say, I've been thinking about this a lot. It's been weighing on me and stuff, and I, I just need to talk to somebody about it. It's not about the fact that they bumped into a car in the parking lot and didn't tell the person about it. It usually has to do with something sexual, something that has gone on. It creates problems in our relationships and so on. But we flip our conscience off. We solve our, you know, solve our conscience and say, it'll all be fine. Why? Well, another sign of serving a little G God is that we put our hope in this God for prosperity or for success or for happiness, and we believe the lies that we're being told. And maybe the biggest deal in worshiping a little G God is that the worship or the addiction or whatever you want to call it elevates the gift beyond the giver. Um, see, in creating us, God gave us the capacity to be deeply connected with another person. And it's hard at first. It's difficult because it involves being vulnerable and sharing and so on. But it teaches us how to really love. It teaches us how to be soulmates with another person. 
But God also gave the gift, amazing gift of sexual pleasure. And like any dangerous thing, it's got to have some you know, high boundaries put around it. Because it's addictive, you see? And that's really the question, isn't it? You know? Like, are you in love? Or are you just addicted to somebody? Because it can feel very similar. But I'm telling you, when you, you know, cheap out, you blow off what God has to say about this and, you know, and find, you know, love, sex, and whatever you're finding, you know, what you've said with your life is, God, I love the gift that you gave me, but I really don't respect you, and I really don't respect any of the prophets that you sent, including your son. I want what you offer, but I really don't want you. And here's the irony for those of us who are human beings, and most of us are human beings, if you're listening to me, I'm guessing that you're a human being, you know? But if you've had some kind of an idea, knowing who he is and knowing what he knows, knowing the power that he gives to keep on going, you know, when you're discouraged and when you feel like giving up, you want him in your life. You want him to guide you. And I'll tell you what happens, okay? Again, I talked about this before, about how that, you know, God is... David actually talked about God as his shepherd. And he goes down through the thing, and he says, he provides for me. Like, I go to bed at night, and I can sleep because I know that he has everything I need. He feeds me. He makes sure that I have plenty to eat. He refreshes me, you know, every morning. He searches for me when I get lost. He guides me when I come to difficult decisions. He protects me when I'm going through the dark times of life, the dark valleys. He prepares me for what's ahead and prepares the place ahead. He blesses me. He spreads his love uh, through my life into the lives of other people. Now, here's the question. Do you really want to make the most important decisions of your life, which have to do with who you're going to spend the rest of your life with or who you're going to be in love with or who you're going to share bed with or who you're going to have kids with and who you're going to share finances with? Do you want to go into that decision and flip God off when you're making that decision? That doesn't even make sense. Why would anybody ever do that? See, many times what happens is we want the blessing of hell, or the blessing of, sorry about that, the blessing of heaven, and we go to hell for advice, which isn't a good idea. Now, the two passages from the Bible that I want to look at as we close. In 2021, the little g, God of love, almost always has a sexual component to it. That's, that's just a fact. And I tell you, that's what makes it so attractive and so addictive, okay? And that's what makes it such a dangerous game to play. Now, Paul was speaking to a church in Corinth. And you have to understand, Corinth was kind of the Las Vegas of that day. You know, what happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth and so on. In fact, they actually said, you know, they had a word Corinthianized, and that means if you are involved in some sexual thing, you know, and you can't find a name for it, just call it Corinthianizing because, you know, there wasn't anything left to the imagination there. They had this attitude that you sometimes hear in our culture. You ever hear, you know, well, you know, sex is just another appetite. It's like hunger, you know, it's like being thirsty and so on. You just go out and satisfy it's no big deal. Well, that was their appetite. And the, the saying that Paul addresses in there is food for the stomach and the stomach for food. And it's no big deal. It's just food. You know, it's just like eating a meal. And Paul says, that's where you're wrong. Listen to what he says. Flee from sexual immorality. So you have to understand, most of the people that he's talking to here were involved in some kind of weird sex thing that was going on in that culture. So that was their past. He said, all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you've received from God? You're not your own. You're bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, in these verses, you know, and in the verses before this, Paul writes a truth that you will never hear when it comes to the little g God of love, you know, in 2021. It's, what he says is sex with a person makes you one with that person. Like, remember the puzzle pieces and stuff? Well, the edges of the puzzle pieces have glue on them. And, and that's not what you hear. But I'm telling you, it makes sense of something that we all know. You ever talk to a woman or known a person who's been raped? It's not like somebody stole their lunch. It goes deep into that person, and it connects with shame and just with all kinds of stuff. You ever talk to a child that's been molested by an adult? This is not like, you know, well, they were an adult, they were an authority figure. Mind. No, this goes deep into their hearts and many times affects how their life turns out. Sex is a very, very complicated thing, and it touches soul on soul. And you just can't go through life, you know, with your... 
you know, with your box of hearts saying, oh, here's one for Fred, you know, and here's one for Louise, you know, and, and here's one for Peter. Oh, look at that, you know, and here's one for, you know, and just keep throwing them out because what you end up with is like when you give yourself away like that, you can end up with an empty box. And you also end up with stuff that you don't want to talk to anybody about. Like I've never heard of anybody, you know, who would say, yeah, you know, sex is like eating, you know, and I've had meals with, you know, thousand different women, you know, before I met you, and they were all good, maybe better than you. Nobody ever talks to the, to the person they're marrying about, you know, sex like they were just trying on shoes. It creates this shame, it creates this part of us that we don't want to talk to them about because we know it's going to affect the relationship. And to ignore this, to just ignore this and to make dumb comments about it, you see, it doesn't make sense. The first issue is that right now your present and what you're doing creates a past, okay? And the past has a really weird way, as I pointed out before, of showing up in your future. You know, when you're no longer high on love drugs. See, Sex is such a thing that, you know, it, the memories of it don't just settle down and go away, you know, and stay, you know, stay put in place, you know, and put in all the boxes you put them in. They come up. We know that. We know that this stuff, you know, this stuff has a way of just haunting our conscience. We know that. There's something else. Let's say you've just thrown yourself into this lifestyle that everybody says is normal. Most people would agree that faithfulness in marriage is a really, really big deal. You see, and the question is, why would anybody think that they can, you know, go and just pig out on all this stuff before they get married, and then when they put on a tux and walk down an aisle, or put on a beautiful dress and walk down an aisle, that it all changes? These are ruts that, we, that, we, that go into our lives, and we're tempted to fall into them again. Another factor I think we need to talk about, and that's the role that deception plays. Now, how many of you think, okay, there's lots of dating websites and different things and Facebook and all this stuff, you know, and they go, they go on out there and so on. How many of you think that when somebody sets one of these things up, like they tell, you know, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, like they just lay it right out there? I don't think so, you know? I think they paint it up and, and you know, put it on, you know, and stuff like this. Like they put on their best face. And then the problem is, like, if you attract somebody like that, like... <laughs> What's going to happen when they find out what you really like or what you really look like? This woman wrote into one of the uh, advice columnists a number of years ago, and she said, you know, she said, I got a problem. I met this guy, and like we're in love with each other and so on, and he's coming to visit me. The problem is I told him that I'm 32 and have no kids, and the truth is I'm 39 and I've got two kids. What do I do? <laughs> Good question, right? It appears to me, who's an outsider, that when it comes to finding the right person in 2021, that there's some bait and switch going on. And I know what bait and switch is, you see, because I'm a fisherman. And my hope is I'm going to put a line on this thing and I'm going to throw it out there. And my prayer is that a big fish will think that it's something to eat and it's going to grab onto this thing. But I'm going to reel it in and then I'm going to cut it up into pieces and I'm going to eat it. Bait and switch, that's what that is. So Here's the question. If you get somebody on the line, if you find a person, if you're able to catch a person, you know, with your hot body or, you know, you catch a girl by having the package, the job, the look, the car, the body, then how do you keep them? Because you see the stuff like that tends to go the way of all the earth, like starts heading for the ground. Love that lasts. Love that is built on something better than that doesn't have to do with how hot you are or how available you are or how much you own or how talented you are, you know, or how hot your car is or how soft your hair is or how full your lips are or how long your eyelashes are. We want to look our best, but the love is not built on the chemicals. It's built on the person that you know. I'm telling you, you will not find love like that on Craigslist or any other place. One of the things that I've learned in this whole series is you can't just get rid of the little G gods that ultimately disappoint you and rip you up, you know, and break your heart. We are attracted to these gods for a reason, because of the needs and because of the deficits that we have. And we, and we stay in love with them and stay worshiping them because we can't say no. 
And the God of love takes the good gifts that God has given us of love and attraction and intimacy and turns them into ultimate things that we will lay our lives on the line for. If we're not careful, if you're not careful, you see, you can end up with a long, hard, depressing tour of duty to a person that you should have never made promises to. What we really want is love, not love. Love is chemicals. And God is the only source of the love that we want the very most. After his description of love in this book, you know, it's found in 1 Corinthians 6 where Paul talks to them about their sexual behavior. Paul describes what everybody's looking for. Listen to this and see if this is what you might want. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. Does not boast. It's not proud. It's not does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It doesn't fly off the handle. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. I've done a lot of weddings. I've lost track, probably 300 or more, okay? And so I've read this passage of Scripture at a lot of those weddings. But I'll tell you, you won't find it on eHarmony.com. You won't find it on, you know, the show The Bachelor or The Bachelorette or, or you won't find it at Cosmopolitan or any cool website. Everybody wants this kind of love. Everybody does. But nobody talks about it because it's hard. And I'll tell you, when the ride is over, you know, and everybody goes on the love drugs, we all fall in love, you know, and so on. But when the ride's over, you want somebody who's going to be patient with you and not keep pushing you into what they want you to do or what they think you ought to be. You know, when, you, when, you, when the ride is over, you want somebody who's going to be kind to you because unkindness rips into your heart. You want somebody who will respect you, who's not rude or arrogant, somebody who is man or woman enough to say, I was wrong. Would you please forgive me? Everyone wants unconditional love. Everybody wants someone who will keep believing the best about them, somebody who will not say, well, I'm going to stop loving you because you disappointed me. And here's the deal. If you fall for the myth of the right person, if you fall for the love myth, that'll never happen. And you're just going to keep dating and hooking up and someday, you know, hoping that the right person who knows how to love like that will end up in your arms. And I'm telling you, it just won't happen. It won't happen. I'm going to close with a story. And this story comes uh, from out of Andy Stanley's book, uh, Love, Sex, and Dating, The New Rules for Love, Sex, and Dating. He talks about a, a woman who was, a young woman who was part of his church and so on. And she was raised, you know, like some of you were raised in homes where you know, you're raised to follow Jesus and love Jesus and so on. But when she left home, again, like some of us, you know, she immersed herself in kind of this single, you know, you know young adult culture of dating. And she says, you know, I didn't stop believing in Jesus. You know, I just kind of put him on the back burner and didn't invite him to go on any of the dates with me. One night she went to this gathering, okay, and she met this guy that she describes as he had the total package. And if you're a woman, you probably know what that means. And he's good looking, you know, and he was serious about his work and he was great personality, he had a really good sense of humor, fun to be with. It was everything that she wanted. She listened to him talk, you know, and she realized that he was a believer in Jesus. And like he was really serious about his faith. Like his faith, you know, affected everything that he did. So this guy brought back all kinds of memories to her, you know. And when she went home for the weekend, she told her mom all about him, you know, that, you know, that he was all that she was thinking about and that he was a serious believer and on and on she went, you know. She hoped that she was going to be able to see him together, see him again and so on. And finally her mom turned to her and said this, sweetheart, the problem is that a guy like that is not looking for a girl like you. And that statement, I mean, went right to her soul. She dissolved, she said, on the floor in this puddle of tears. And she knew her mom loved her. And she wasn't just being cruel and trying to stick her, okay, for this. She was just being truthful. And she said, that was a defining moment in my life. And it was a day when everything changed. My values changed. How I dated, my friendships, you know, took a whole new direction with my love, with my life. Now here's the truth behind that. It's not about finding the right person and that everything's going to work out just fine. You're going to live happily ever after. It's about becoming the right 
person. And so this is kind of where I want to close, okay? Are you who the person that you're looking for is looking for? Because you see, it's not about finding the right person. It's about becoming the right person. I want to ask you, who are you looking for? Are you looking for somebody who has character? Are you looking for somebody who has a center line down their highway? Are you looking for somebody who doesn't dance to what everybody else thinks ought to happen? Someone who doesn't try to anesthetize themselves with booze and drugs, you know? And you have to ask, is the person that I'm looking for looking for someone like me? And if not, what am I going to do about that? And I'll tell you what a great start is. A great start is learning how to love. Jesus made it clear. He says, you know, he said, when you want to boil everything down, it comes down to, you know, if you love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and loving others as you love yourself, then it's about love, not love. Love is chemistry. Love is chemistry. And you don't want to be stuck in some chemistry lesson. You want to know somebody and find somebody, hopefully, who knows how to love. And God is the one, through his spirit, who can make that happen in our hearts. He's the only one that can change our hearts like that. But you have to invite him to do it. He won't just crash his way in. He will. He'll help you in this most critical arena of life. And so I'd just encourage you to ask him for help and tell him that you'll cooperate. Let's pray. God, this whole arena is something that gets talked about a lot in our culture. And there are movies that are made about it, and every day people come up with new, you know, Instagram pictures and all this stuff that's intended to try and bring somebody their way. And I pray that, God, you would help us to live with sanity in a world that is insane when it comes to to this whole arena. I pray that you'd bring life. I pray for those who are feeling the pain of loneliness, that God, you will give them the courage to make really good, wise cho choices and not make their choices under the influence of chemicals. So guide us. We sure need your help. We really do. Amen. We're going to worship, and then I'm going to come back.
coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me prayer for you is that you would find real love, the kind of love that's talked about here, love that's patient and kind, not rude, not selfish. It's the kind of love that God gives. It's the kind of love that completes us, the kind of love that makes our lives worth living, and when we give it, makes other people's lives worth living. And so may God give you power. May his spirit give you strength, and may he fill you with the fruit of of the Spirit that will help you to be that kind of person. Amen. Good morning, Olive Branch family. Today I'm joined by Scott Duncan, founder of Sharing the Burden, and Sharing the Burden is one of our community partners. Scott, can you tell us what Sharing the Burden is all about? Well, Sharing the Burden really is a, a bunch of support groups that we put together wherever we can. And uh, we specialize also in uh, support groups within the jail system of Ontario, mostly in the Milton and Toronto area jails. Uh, we have short meetings, uh, but we have a lot of meetings. We can have up to 10 meetings a week in those jails, and probably four or five of the community type uh, meetings. But we meet to share, you know, and sharing seems to start a healing process. And that's really the crux, you know, share uh, biblically using. Uh, Biblical instruments, if you will, recovery devotionals, such as you supply sometimes in the Life Recovery Bible. Scott, can you tell us a story um, that illustrates or highlights your ministry? But this lady that I'm going to talk about, uh, we met in jail about six years ago now. And, and for four years, I met this lady uh, weekly, as we were saying before. And, and uh, believe it or not, over time, she we saw the change in her. She, she came in, and she's a great big lady. She came in as someone who, you know, she's not even interested, just doing, making time, getting out of the cell or sort of thing. And anyway, uh, she never spoke. And then in the last couple of years, she started talking. And I noticed she was the most consistent uh, attendee of anyone who ever came to our meeting. So anyway, in the end, she, uh, she got life in prison in a penitentiary. And she writes me this. I'll just read a couple of lines. She says, uh, thanks for writing me back, Scott. Your kind words made me cry. Tears of happiness and joy. So if you knew this lady, <laughs> that's, that's incredible. And she says a little further on, she says, I wish they were sharing the burden meetings here. Having had them at Vandy really gave me something to look forward to. Thank you for coming even on those hard days. You and your group really helped a lot of us. And that's kind of the story. You know, that's the best I can do is testimony of people moving on and sticking with us. 
As a church, we've provided you with uh, life recovery devotionals. Last year, we were also able to provide you with uh, gas gift cards for your volunteers. But how could other people uh, continue to support you and your ministry? Uh, probably doing more of this kind of thing would be one area, just to uh, get us in front of some people and uh, let them know what we do. I mean, we support anybody. We don't necessarily support uh, you know, addicts and alcoholics and uh, mentally ill like we do in jail. I mean, we have people who come just, not the fellowship, but come for uh, for their ability to share or just listen. Sharing is healing, it's, it's unbelievable. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, Scott. If you guys would like to learn more about Sharing the Burden, you can head to their website. Thank you so much for continuing to give uh, and being generous to the Olive Branch so that we can continue to support our community partners. Thank you.